Well, I've been a veterinarian for 20 years. I practice predominantly on small animals, but I've practiced for the past 13 years at my current location in Columbia County. My practice is focused on preventive care, so I do routine testing for tick-borne diseases with dogs, mostly because we have an easy in-house test that we use to diagnose them. Also, we do routine blood screenings for uh, kidney disease in cats, for instance. It's a very huge problem in cats uh, in, in, over the age of eight or hyperthyroidism, but I focus mostly on preventive care. Looking for better ways to treat kidney failure in cats certainly is a, a big issue. Uh, cancer treatments, alternative medicine I'd say is really gaining a lot of ground. Acupuncture uh, treatments, sometimes in Western medicine we don't have everything that we we're able to do for the pet and I, they've been treating animals with acupuncture and 2,000, 3,000 years, so I think that's certainly another modality that we can use to treat animals. So that's a hot topic. The tick-borne diseases are also a hot topic, Lyme disease, Babesia, Anaplasma, Bartonella is a huge new, it's not really new, but most practitioners aren't aware of Bartonella and what it does. It's sort of a stealth path pathogen. As I see it, it immunosuppresses the body and sets you up for other infections that wouldn't be a problem so much. Cats are clinically resistant to the development of tick-borne diseases. That doesn't mean they can't get them because they certainly do. I believe most of the differences with, with the cat is cats groom themselves fastidiously unless there's something wrong with them, whether they're, they have a, a lesion on their tongue or, or dental disease, they like to be clean. And so the tick is not going to stay on them for two or three days usually, if they can get at the tick. The best method though is you want to remove the tick. You do not want to grab the tick with your fingers because once you squeeze the tick, you're actually inoculating all the pathogens that are in the tick into your pet or yourself if you are trying to remove a tick off of yourself as well. So you want to grab it at the skin level and gently remove it at the skin level. There are various devices you can use for that. A tick spoon. I am on the Lyme Disease Task Force for my county and I keep statistics. When I first moved there and we started doing the tick testing, about 70% of the dogs were positive for Lyme. We did not have an anaplasma test at that time. Now we would have the 40X test, which includes anaplasma. About 50% of the dogs are positive for anaplasma, and about 40% have both of them. I have very little Ehrlichia canis in my area, although every year about two or three dogs will test positive. That's predominantly a disease of southern dogs, but we do have many dogs that come up from the south because of the rescues. Many of the kill shelters exist down south and these dogs will be on death row. So I have several of my clients will make a run down to North Carolina, Louisiana, Virginia, and they will rescue these dogs. And so what pathogens exist down south are now moving up north. Routinely I will screen for anaplasma, Lyme disease, or Lichia canis because it's an easy in-house test, it's a, an antibody test, an ELISA-based test. If, if I don't get my answer with that, or if I'm concerned about Babesia, will we send, I will send the, the blood out to be tested. We do Western blots, just like they do in people. We do quantitative C6 ELISAs in dogs, that gives me an actual number. And um, sometimes they'll use that test in people as well, but it's not as common. Mostly they do Western blots in people. The, I also test cats, especially for Bartonella, although Bartonella can infect dogs as well. We do believe it's a tick-borne disease, although it has been spread by fleas and sheep. For instance, the sheep ked spreads it Bartonella to sheep. They also have demonstrated that sheep Bartonella has infected people, and we didn't think that they, it would cross species, but it has been shown to do that. I've had a, a subset of dogs that the owner will call me up and say he's got Lyme back, he's not eating, he's got a fever, his joints are swollen. 
there is no placebo effect in animals. I'll put them on antibiotics and usually by the next day, the dogs act completely normal. We do treat them for a month. In some of these cases, I'll repeat testing and they're always Lyme positive. That says to me that either this organism is sequestered in an area where the animal animal's own immune defense cannot rid the organism from the body and or the antibiotic does not diffuse there, such as joints or in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's, it's hard to get antibiotics in that area because of the blood-brain barrier. But these dogs always will still test positive on the ELISA test, the C6 peptide. Is that because they're still chronically infected? I think possibly. It doesn't necessarily mean they're actively dividing, but these bacteria can release little blebs which have antigens on them and so the body will react to them. The immune system wants to get rid of it and so then you're, you're going to make an antibody. So I think that's one reason they test chronically positive. Most infections, bacterial infections, if the body clears it, the antibody will persist for about nine months or a year and then it goes away. That's not true with Lyme in the, most of the patients that I see. Once the dog is positive, they stay positive for the rest of their life. Lyme doesn't really like to be too hot. So for instance, birds, they have isolated Lyme in birds, but it doesn't really live in, in them because I think, and their body temperature is much hotter than, than we are. I just don't think the Lyme can live in the bird, even though they have isolated, because the ticks can feed off birds, and, um, but they, they're not clinically ill with it. So I think, I think their bodies are, a little better adapted to get rid of some of these infections. However, a lot of the tick-borne diseases such as Babesia, the dogs are chronically positive and it can be spread uh, to the offspring. The puppies can be born with Babesia, which is kind of scary when you think about it. And also uh, it can be transmitted via blood transfusion or bite wounds. And it's very common in fighting pit bulls. Well, I certainly have isolated streptococcus from ears of dogs and with people in the family that have had strep throat. And uh, it's a beta hemolytic streptococcus that we've isolated and do sensitivities to. Where did that come from? Was it a household member? Quite possibly, but I usually do these cultures when there's a member of the family that keeps getting recurrent strep throat. So we need to treat everyone in the family if, if this is happening on a routine basis. There was also a cat that they did isolate H1N1 out of the cat, which we didn't really think cats would get human influenza virus, but they tested this kitty because the kitty developed respiratory signs after all of the family members developed respiratory signs of an indoor kitty and didn't have exposure to anyone else and they did actually isolate the cat recovered and was fine. To my knowledge, I don't know of anyone that's really focusing on zoonotic pathogens, especially not the Bartonella, other than Dr. Breischwert. He's done a lot of research. Matter of fact, he goes to the CDC and tries to impress upon them how severe a disease Bartonella can actually play in people, especially veterinarians that are chronically ill and no one knows what's wrong with them. And he has to go back year after year to talk to them and they still haven't made a decision as far as how extensive Bartonella is. I usually tell my clients it's more like a septic tank. Um, you name it, it can be in a tick. Well, I think we're just beginning to figure out what can be carried by ticks. They can even carry microfilarial organisms, which typically, for an example, heartworm is a microfilarial disease in dogs spread by mosquitoes. Now we found that ticks can also carry them. Well, in my mind, if you have persistence of bacteria in the body, then it's still there causing disease. So if you can isolate it out of the joints, you can isolate it out of many tissues, pericardium, heart, kidney, bladder, nervous tissue, joints, synovium, just about tendons, just about anywhere you want to look, you can find Lyme at autopsy or necropsy if you, if you look for it. So in my mind, if the bacteria is still there, it has the potential to still cause illness. Certainly if you have other 
problems going on, whether you're immunosuppressed because you have, you're diabetic, or you're on immune suppressive therapy for another condition, or if you have a, an implant of some sort, say, say you have a, a pacemaker, or you have a bone plate, maybe you had a broken bone. Certainly, chronic infections can exist in the bone, and you might not be clinical for it, but studies have shown that, for instance, in dogs that have had a broken bone plated, there can be a, a low-grade chronic infection in that plate, and then it turns into a bone cancer, and then you amputate the leg, and it's just, it's just a mess. So I think chronic infections do a lot more than, than we know at the present time.